the National Academy of Sports Medicine Certified Personal Trainer Exam, more commonly known as the NASM CPT exam. How hard is it to pass? How should you prepare for it? Let's talk about it. Coming from someone who's been pretty active in the fitness community since 2017, it's been really crazy looking at the post-COVID era of fitness. I, I feel like 2020, when everyone went home and actually had time to exercise, uh, was really like the peak of the fitness industry. And since then, fitness in general has just been so popular and it's been trending so much more than it was before. As a result, I've seen an increasingly large number of people uh, going out of their way to educate themselves and try to pass this NASM CPT exam. Obviously, I've been one of those people and I just passed my NASM CPT exam last week and I just figured I would stop and share some secrets for success and some tips that I have for studying and preparing for your exam with you guys and how difficult it is to actually pass this exam and to get your certified personal trainer uh, credentials and certification. So if you didn't know already, NASM, the National Academy of Sports Medicine, offers a CPT, Certified Personal Trainer Exam, which you could pass in order to get your, your credentials. Uh, that way you can be a practicing certified personal trainer. So if you're like myself, when I first started looking into this and you're kind of intimidated because you don't really know what to expect regarding this course, allow me to compare this, uh, this approach in studying NASM to some terms that you may be more familiar with. So just to put things into perspective, uh, if you're like myself, when I first started trying to study this material, if you have no clue how to compare this course to any other course you've taken, or if you don't really know uh, how to perceive this level of work and this level of studying, I'll compare it to a couple different things real quick. So first things first, I'd say it's most like a college fast track course. If you've ever taken a college fast track course, they're essentially courses that you take over your winter break or your summer break that are condensed down to like four, six, or eight weeks. These classes have been shortened, so usually you don't spend as much time in class because these classes require you to spend more time on your own studying at a faster rate in order to get the coursework material done in four, six, or eight weeks rather than a full-length semester like 12 to 16 weeks. So if you've ever taken one of these courses in college, I'd say go about doing this NASM exam and covering these study materials for your NASM CPT exam, just like how you would do a, a self-paced fast track class, right? So for me, this is something that I really approached it in that uh, that same way, I told myself I had about, you know, two, three weeks to try to get it done. Uh, I gave myself, you know, a few days here and there to miss, but I more or less tried to approach this the same way I would a, uh, a shortened uh, fast track class in college. So if you haven't taken one of these college courses, let's just say you have a high school diploma, I would say compare this to a high school book report. Obviously, this isn't a novel. This is a uh, nonfiction textbook, right? Uh, but if you've gone through high school, you have some sort of basic understanding of, you know, uh, very, very, very basic science and biology. And if you're already a gym rat, then you should be able to pick this book up and really just study the book inside and out, you know, cover to cover. That way, when it comes time to prepare for your exam, you could just uh, go through, you know, reread re through your notes and start preparing almost as if it was a book report in high school. Meaning you should know the book good enough to where you could write about it, you could write a paper about it if you really needed to, similar to like a novel book report you'd have to do in high school. And you should also know the book well enough to get tested on it, because obviously that's what you end up having to do. So obviously the actual uh, content of the book is, is non-fiction. It's, it's entry level, like very, very, very basic science and, uh, and fitness education information stuff. Right, but uh, at the end of the day, you could really approach it the same way that you would a you know a senior book project, a, a senior novel project. Just really dive into understanding the text the way that you would with one of those book reports, and and you should be all right. And it's also safe to say that if you're already a gym rat and you're already familiar with going to the gym and, and training, then a lot of this stuff will really come really easy to you. And you'll find a lot of this to be super familiar because you've already lived this stuff, right? So a quick disclaimer, uh, something that I've learned in school, uh, something that I wish I knew earlier, was simply to cut your costs where you can. Uh, NASM's gonna offer you study material, but oftentimes you could find it cheaper through a third party. Uh, I'm not going to shout any out because I'm not getting paid to shout anyone out. But there's other companies that offer like uh, audio lectures and little study guides and uh, 
practice quizzes to take as you finish your uh, chapters of the book as you're studying. And a lot of the times they'll be cheaper elsewhere rather than the ones that NASM provides. Furthermore, the same thing goes for your textbook. Uh, anyone who's, who's been in college will tell you that your, book st your bookstore on your campus will 100% rip you off. If you go buy a college textbook on campus, they might charge you $100 for it. But if you go on the publisher's website, they might have it for $70. And if you go on Amazon, you might be able to find it for $50. So when looking for your NASM textbook, uh, definitely look around for a deal. Chances are you'll probably find it cheaper somewhere else online than you would on NASM's actual website. So like I already mentioned, if you're already a gym rat and you're pretty familiar with just exercise in general, there's gonna be a lot of stuff in this book that you're gonna be able to pick up on really, really easily. A, a lot of these earlier chapters in the book, you're really gonna feel like you're spinning your wheels and like you're just relearning stuff that you already knew. That being said, the material does get harder in some chapters than other than others. Some chapters are significantly larger than others. Some are easier to read than others. But really, there's a few tips that you could follow that I found made me successful in my, my exam and I would recommend to you guys if you were planning on taking your exam as well. So real quick, I just wanted to go over five tips that I found helpful for studying for my exam. My number one tip is definitely gonna be give yourself enough time to prioritize studying for your NASM exam. Okay, so first things first, and this example is rather personal, but I would say give yourself time to strictly prioritize studying your NASM book. In my situation, I was a full-time student and a part-time employee, so on top of the schoolwork I was already doing and the time I was spending uh, at work after school, I was really too busy to study this book in its entirety. Uh, you could try to skim read at night before you go to bed and get little bits done at a time, but with a book that's this big, it really helps out to read it quicker. That way you're not forgetting a bunch of the information from the earlier chapters by the time you're finished. It took me like multiple months to get the first five chapters done because I was so busy with school and work. But once I had a break from school, you know, for winter break and I quit my job, I was able to knock out a chapter a day every day for like two weeks straight and finish the whole book in like 12, 14 days. So understand that if you cut other things out and you really just focus on getting the book done and you focus on moving at a faster pace, you're gonna do a lot better on your practice exams, on your study materials, and I think you'll do better on the exam too because you're not waiting extended periods of time in between learning chapters. It's really easy, especially for me, it was easy for me to buy the book, buy the study materials, study a chapter, get busy, you know, life happens, and then a week later, I'm studying the next chapter, and I'm already forgetting the stuff that I had learned, you know, seven days prior, because it's been so long since I revisited the material. Number two is gonna be memorize and rehearse real life examples of the most important terms for each chapter. Especially if you're someone who skim reads and you're not gonna read everything word for word, cover to cover, I would say definitely prioritize memorizing and rehearsing uh, the definitions of specific phrases and then knowing how to apply them to real life situations. So obviously with something like flexibility, for instance, which is a pretty, uh, pretty popular topic in this book, it's a pretty long chapter and you're gonna get a lot of exam questions about it. You should really make it a point to not only memorize the definitions of different terms for the subject of flexibility, but you should also prioritize thinking of real life examples that would fit those definitions. So when I was first reading fiction, for instance, let's talk about Superman, I'd tell myself, okay, Superman, protagonist, right? Uh, Lex Luthor, antagonist, right? Good, bad, here's the hero we're rooting for, here's the villain who's you know plotting against him, right? Antagonist, bad guy, protagonist, good guy, you know, rah, 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 rah. Um, and essentially understanding those roles in a fictional story and then being able to attribute characters to those roles in a story that you're familiar with helps you remember them. Same thing goes for uh, more scientific concepts like the stuff that you're gonna read in the NASM CPT uh, Essentials of Personal Training textbook. So if we're thinking about, you know, a, a pushing movement, then obviously the prime movers on the front, you know, let's say a bench press, you know, the pec would obviously be a protagonist muscle. Meanwhile, you know, a muscle on the back, let's say the lats, you know, that, that would obviously be an antagonist muscle. For the task of pushing something, you could automatically attribute, okay, what muscles are doing the pushing? And then, okay, what muscles are typically used for pulling that are going to be uh, not necessarily helping the pushing movement, but they're gonna be more antagonists. So then attributing muscles to movements like that can help you understand differences between 
protagonist, antagonist, the same way that it would in a story or, or any other context. So I would make sure to definitely make sure that you could apply real world examples to those definitions because that's what's going to help you remember these. For the more specific questions within a chapter, as long as you know the definitions and you have a little bit of critical thinking ability, you should be able to at least play process of elimination towards making the most you know, educated guess really, the most educated guess towards what gives you a shot at actually getting the question right. And that becomes significantly easier if you just memorize the definitions and some real world examples that fit them. Number three is going to be study the most important chapters a second time. Okay, so for this third piece of advice, I actually viewed a bunch of different videos online from people who are giving advice on their NASM CPT exams. And I found that a lot of people prioritized certain chapters. I gathered what chapters everyone more or less agreed on, and then I altered that list a little bit with the ones that I found really important. And I found that there were four chapters that I, along with countless other content creators, have all agreed on are really, really important and really essential towards passing your exam. So uh, in my opinion, based off of uh, what my peers have said and what I saw in my exam, I'd say your most important chapters to study for sure are going to be chapter five, human movement science, chapter six, the fitness assessment, chapter 13, resistance training concepts, chapter 14, optimum performance training or the OPT model, and you could kind of throw flexibility in there, but I'll kind of touch up on that more with my uh, fifth piece of, piece of advice. You don't really need to know that whole chapter in its entirety. I'd really just focus on the four that I just listed. So if you're studying the book like I recommend you do, and that's one chapter after the other, beginning to end, cover to cover, what you'll want to do is you'll want to come back and read these chapters a second time, or at least come back and skim read them while revisiting your notes from when you read those chapters the first time. These chapters, at least from what I remember, seem to have a lot of questions and a lot of information that applies to questions on the entirety of the exam. Meanwhile, there's some chapters like nutrition that you really won't see a whole lot on the exam for. As long as you remember the basics of that chapter, you know, the, the definitions, as I previously mentioned, you'll be able to pretty much solve any other problems or questions that are asked on that chapter simply based on knowing the vocabulary and real world, real world examples that apply to the vocabulary. So I would definitely say go back, revisit those chapters again a second time. That way you could really understand those concepts in their entirety. Uh, and make sure that there's nothing that you missed that first time because those are the ones that are going to make up the vast majority of the questions that you're actually going to be getting asked. The fourth piece of advice is going to be to take your practice exams and then to take your feedback from those practice exams to look at and reevaluate the problems that you got incorrect and then to further research those subjects of the problems that you got wrong. Obviously, when you're studying for an exam, it makes sense to double down on your weaknesses. So I would recommend that regardless of uh, what company you go through in order to buy your study material, whether it's through NASM, whether it's through a third party, I would definitely recommend buying a a uh, study material package that allows you to take practice exams. Simply because you could take these practice exams and when you get your results back, you could see which problems you got wrong and then you could, you know, circle, underline, highlight those problems and then go out of your way to make sure that you continue to research and double down on those. And if you keep doing that enough times, you'll recognize that your practice exam scores continue to get higher and higher on average and you really build your confidence up before taking your exam which I find is really useful. And my fifth and final piece of advice is more of a personal test taking piece of advice that really applies to any subject that you're studying and it definitely applies to NASM a lot but in the context of NASM it is to master human anatomy. In order to provide some context let's let's look back to like 10th grade right in 10th grade, I remember I needed to prepare for a chemistry final, and I was terrible at math. Obviously, a big part of chemistry is applied math. I was terrible at math. I didn't trust my calculations, but one thing that I did, and I knew that I had to do this in order to pass, was I studied the periodic table. I'm not saying that I knew the periodic table, like the back of my hand, like exactly 100% perfect, but the more that I studied the periodic table, the more that I would understand what the questions were asking, how to write out the problems, what formulas to use, and that ended up scoring me a lot higher than if I had just gone into the exam not knowing the periodic table as well as I did. Yeah, I probably 
probably crunched a lot of numbers wrong. Uh, yes, there's quite a few problems that I got wrong, but the fact of the matter is, is that within the context of chemistry, I knew a bunch of the elements and that helped me pass. The same exact thing I've always used on history exams. You could even look at my podcast that I did on George Orwell's Animal Farm, and we spend like the first 20, 25 minutes of that whole podcast just assigning characters to their real world counterparts. Assigning characters to, you know, whoever it is that they're supposed to be symbolic or allegorical of. I found that in uh, history courses, if you memorize all of the important dates, the things that happened on those dates, and you memorize all the important names and what those people were known for, right there, you could already use just that basic understanding of what happened on what dates and what attributes can be attributed to which people to use the process of, el of elimination to really make great educated guesses on a history exam and really give yourself a fair chance at passing even if you didn't read all the course materials. That's really something that I have to say about NASM. It's that, and that's something that I really have to say about NASM. See, even if you don't remember all of the textbook, spoiler alert, you're not going to. It's a 550 page textbook. The fact of the matter is, is that if you master human ana anatomy and you make sure that you know the basics of human anatomy, then you could really give yourself a fair shot on just making educated guesses and critical th critically thinking during the exam to solve problems while you're taking them. A lot of people want to memorize answers going in, but if you just know the human anatomy, you could stop and think through problems and, you know, kind of perform the movements in your mind and think about what muscles are contracting and which muscles are relaxing. And just by knowing that, you could get a lot of problems right during your exam just from knowing the anatomy right. With a big textbook like this, you're not expected to remember everything, and it's because you're not even going to get tested on everything. But if you know the concepts well, then you could actually just you know, solve the problems, critically think, and, and work through the problems in your head during the exam. You have over two hours to take it, so there's no need to rush. It's, it's more than enough time in my experience. So really take the time to memorize the human anatomy, simply because that will give you a really good fighting a chance while you're taking the exam. So for example, let's just say there's a question that says something along the lines of, what muscle is tight if the arms fall forward during, during an overhead squat assessment? If you have answers like A, vastus medialis, B, adductors, C, soleus, and D, pectoralis major, you could look at these four answers, and if you know where these muscles are in your human body, you could think about it. Okay, A, vastus medialis. Well, that's the inner teardrop of your quads. It's That's definitely not going to cause your arms to fall forward. That's in the lower body. Okay, adductors, we know that's in the innermost part of your groin. That's obviously not going to cause your shoulders to fall forward. C, soleus, we know that's in the calf. What, what relationship does that have to your arms falling forward? D, pectoralis major. So in that case, you have three answers that are all in the lower body, and you have one that's in the upper body. Well, if we're talking about the arms falling forward, the only answer that makes sense here is the one answer that is located in the upper body. So this is what I'm talking about when I say master anatomy. If you memorize where muscles are in the human body, and you know what exercises are when they're being referred to, so if, if you know what the overhead squat assessment is, or if you know what the bench press is, or if you know what the squat is, you know what I mean? If you know the exercises, and you know the human anatomy, you could really cross off, you know, one, two, sometimes even three of the answers simply because they're completely irrelevant to the exercise and they have nothing to do with the exercise. And and this is just a piece of test taking advice in general, but just knowing that stuff, you know, in, in the context of, of chemistry in 10th grade, you know, memorizing the periodic table in the context of a history class, you know, memorizing specific dates and memorizing specific names and in the context of a NASM textbook, just memorizing your human anatomy. Those are the greatest tools that are going to give you a really good fighting chance when you're taking this exam, even if you freak out and forget a bunch of the other stuff you know. Knowing the human anatomy will seriously set you up for success, so that's my fifth and final piece of advice for succeeding on your NASM exam. That being said, I greatly appreciate you if you've made it this far into the video. Uh, subscribe if you're new, leave a like if you enjoyed, comment down below to start a discussion. Until next time, this is the host. You're watching The Gray Medium. Stay gray.